All right. Well, welcome to the third Global MD's Blood Pressure Boot Camp. I'm Dr. Giovanni Rondo, and I am the CEO and founder of Global MD. Global MD is the sponsor for the Blood Pressure Boot Camp. And our goal with the Blood Pressure Boot Camp is for people to uh, understand, uh, avoid, and also treat high blood pressure, sometimes with medications, but mostly with lifestyle uh, modifications. Um, I want to help people not only understand, prevent, and manage high blood pressure, but also be able to teach others about high blood pressure, how to how they can avoid it, and how to manage it, how to treat it, and doing it in ways, yes, like I said, um, utilizing medications, but also utilizing lifestyle modification, like what we eat, like our exercise routine like um, things that have to do with like stress. So those are things that I really wanna focus on during this time. So today we're actually doing the foodie version of blood pressure boot camp. And with that, with the foodie version, I, because food, like um, one, of the, one of the statistics that I found is that probably a good, 60 to maybe 75% of chronic disease management has to do with what we put into our system. And that is not only food, but the things that we drink. Um, if we use any kind of illicit drugs, of course, or have alcohol, all those things play a role in uh, uh, chronic disease, like high blood pressure, like diabetes, um, like even things like COPD. Um, because we're ingesting, you know, things like uh, tobacco in our system or the nicotine um, that really can affect us uh, in a deleterious way. So that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to focus on food because we all have to eat and, but we can of course make healthier choices. And how do we do that? How do we, you know, not only make those healthier choices, how to, how do we make sure that um, we know the healthier choices to make, not only in the food intake, but just other things overall. So that's why I'm calling this the, the foodie version. Mm -hmm. So, um, so welcome to everyone. And even though I'm going to be speaking, um, I'd like for everyone to be put on mute if you could. Yeah, if you could mute your phones. Um, yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. And what I'd like, um, I, I'm, I'm completely open for people to be able to speak and be able to ask questions. Even though I'm gonna be talking um, and I would like for the most part for things to be muted, but if you do have a question, please, you know, ask the questions. I would really like for this to be not just a monologue, but really a dialogue where we discuss, you know, our own lives um, and, and how maybe high blood pressure has affected us or how we want to avoid, you know, uh, having issues with high blood pressure and what we can do to, you know, support each other overall. So, um, so it is my belief, well, with high blood pressure, it's not just the numbers that's the concern, it's what it can do to your body. It increases your risk for stroke, heart attacks, heart failure, kidney disease, in addition to so many other health uh, issues and health problems. I don't know if y'all realize this, but during this pandemic, um, there are people who are considered more immunocompromised or are more greatly affected because of you know, COVID overall. And believe it or not, people with high blood pressure are put in that a little bit of a higher risk category. So it's not the same exact um, mechanism um, like diabetes or if you're on steroids or things like that that can, or having HIV um, that can affect your immune system, but having high blood pressure works in a different way, but it does increase your risk. Um, for so many other uh, health conditions. I do believe that people may not have to suffer from high blood pressure and its effect with knowledge, knowing how and putting into action a few simple, like I said, lifestyle modifications. And that's really what this boot camp is all about, is giving you the tools you need to live a healthier life. 
Okay. And it's about quality, not only quantity. Okay. So I'm going to assume that most of us either have high blood pressure, know somebody who has high blood pressure, or really want to avoid <laughs> trying to get it. And so um, if you would like, if you can, as long as you're not driving, put in the chat, you know, like what category you fall in, whether you actually have high blood pressure, whether you know someone who has high blood pressure, um, or whether you're trying to avoid it, okay? And so um, I can go first, of course, since I'm, you know, here and talking, but I grew up with high blood pressure in terms of with my family, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So lots of different people in my family had high blood pressure. And so when I was younger, I was able to do some things uh, that, uh, okay, Najiba, okay, you want to avoid having high blood pressure, absolutely. So I wanted to do some things that helped me to decrease my risk for it because I understood at an early age, I had a really great primary care physician who talked about high blood pressure and how that you know, definitely could run in families. And so I tried to do some things that helped me to avoid it. And one of the things that I did was I modified my diet and I, well, I naturally was an athlete or I think I still am kind of sorta, um, or I try to be, but, um, but I stopped eating very certain types of very salty or cured foods, particularly pork. So when I was in college, um, I'll never forget, I had a big thing of country ham one time and I got a massive headache after that point. And I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm not eating that stuff anymore or very, yeah, anymore, I stopped it. And I think by doing that, I was able to ward off having high blood pressure, at least for a long time. Unfortunately, now I do have high blood pressure for probably so many different reasons. But, you know, family history does play a role. Stress plays a role. What you eat plays a role. And aging, you know, um, that, that does play a role in terms of, of, of having high blood pressure. So, so to give you a little bit more background into my why, high blood pressure literally is very close to my heart. It was the very first medical term or diagnosis I had ever heard of as a small child. Both my parents had high blood pressure, so I heard about it pretty much during uh, my young years. My mother in particular suffered from high blood pressure and had uh, a, what they called a weak heart back then. And she went into what's called congestive heart failure. And that she actually passed when I was 17, just a week into my first week or my first week into a college. So it was really devastating for our whole family. The reason why I have uh, this particular uh, day to have this boot camp is that today is my mother's birthday. So I do this in honor of my mother. And so she would have been um, 88 today. Sorry, I don't mean to cry. So she would have been 88. So I'm doing this in, in memory of her. So I would like for women uh, or anyone really to be able to have a longer life. My mother passed when uh, she was 54 and I was 17. Um, but one of the things that my mother uh, left in terms of her legacy, she would say that she learned something new every day. And I try to do the same thing. I try to learn something new every day. And I hope that this boot camp, you learn something new, not only for your education, but you will be able to apply the tools um, for true transformation particularly if you have any kind of chronic uh, medical uh, conditions, or you can help transform uh, for others in their life. So let's go ahead and get started with the outline. And I apologize, I am actually, okay, let's see if I can, okay, I'm going to, I did a few things on my phone, so I'm actually going to check in on my phone and see if I can share the screen. So I'm going to be flipping around here. I apologize. Okay, so I'm going to switch. Okay, I'm back <laughs> on the other side. And so this back here is a picture of me and my mom, one of the last pictures that I took 
uh, with my mother. And um, so with this picture, uh, so that's in my background. So, all right, I'm going to share. Hopefully I can uh, share my screen. Um, hold on just a moment. Okay, um, let's see if we can do this, okay. Okay. All right, so this is the, I hope you all can see the outline. Okay, I am so sorry. <laughs> this is definitely, I am technologically challenged, so I apologize. Let's see if I can. Hmm. Okay, so this is just basically the, the, the first screen, and then I hope you all can see the second screen. And this just is just talking about the outline for today. Um, we're just, of course, did the welcome introduction, uh, the warm up and stretch is going to be next. Uh, we're going to do a cooking demonstration. We're actually going to have a discussion about food and high blood pressure with the cardiologist, Dr. Kim Williams. Um, there's questions, um, but of course, if you want to, you feel comfortable putting questions in the chat or un, um, um, excuse me, unmuting yourself and putting or, or you know asking the question. Um, and then we're going to do a cool down, and then we're going to wrap it up. Okay. And so next slide is, it's just a, a picture of my mom. And like I mentioned, she said she would learn something new every day. And so I just love this quote um, by Morgan Freeman. You learn nothing from life if you think you're right all the time. So I think a lot of times, um, we as physicians or in the medical fields, you know, we're looked to as being the absolute authority on everything in the whole world, or, you know, from a medical perspective. And believe it or not, I'm learning something new every single day. And I think most doctors uh, and most healthcare professionals are learning something new every day. When we stop learning, we stop growing. So it's always good to learn and grow. And I would advise that not just for people in the medical field, but just all of us to learn and to, to, to continue to grow. So of course we're talking about high blood pressure. And so just continuing on with the, with the introduction. Um, Types of high blood pressure, there's essential, which means primary, and then there's secondary, which means there's an underlying cause. So primary just means there's no underlying cause. It's just, it happens and it's 95% of the cases of having high blood pressure or hypertension. Hypertension is just a different uh, way or a fancier way of saying high blood pressure, okay? And then these are just some secondary uh, causes, sorry, of, uh, hypertension or high blood pressure, renal, which means kidney. Um, and it can be in certain areas. It can be the parenchymal, which is just a fancy term for outside of the vascular or the blood, blood flow within the kidneys. You can have it within your endocrine system and it could be miscellaneous. There's so many you know, other causes for having high blood pressure. Things like um, taking steroids, um, having certain types of uh, tumors within your body, I'm having sleep apnea. Those are some other causes for hypertension or high blood pressure. Okay, and I'm just gonna get out of this screen. Okay. Okay, let me get back out. Okay. All right, can everyone hear me? Okay. All right. So. And if you have any questions, like I said, just feel free to um, put it in the chat um, or, you know, you can 
unmute yourself and then, you know, just definitely ask questions. So just going along with the outline, what we're going to do, I'm actually going to go back to the other, I'm going to switch to the, to my other computer. Okay, so the next part, and we have another, let's see, I just want to see who this is, who's coming in. Okay, we'll just go ahead and go to the next part, and I'll just try to identify that person that's coming in now. Um, we're going to do a quick warm-up um, and a quick stretch, just because being physically active is super important when it comes to you know, controlling your blood pressure and managing it. So we're just, just, of course, if you're driving or, or doing anything that's out that takes your full attention, I don't want you to uh, take that away. But, you know, if you can, um, if you can um, just get in a chair with a back to it, okay? And I'm going to kind of try to show you some of the things that I'm doing. It's just a quick little uh, warm up, a quick little stretch that we're just going to do. Physical activity is super important when it comes to high blood pressure. Um, excuse me, trying to avoid high blood pressure and managing it. So, um, sitting with your Okay, with your back in, in your chair, you're just gonna take some nice deep breaths in. I apologize, my phone keeps falling in out. In, through your nose and out. In through your nose and out through your mouth. Okay. And then take both arms and just a nice little stretch up. Nice little stretch up and bring them down and bring them forward. And then stretching up again. Okay, bringing them down. Looks like our speaker is here. Hello, Dr. Williams. We're just doing a, a little stretch, quick Big stretch. Time. Okay. Great. Just explaining that high blood pressure can be affected by inactivity. And so we just wanted to go ahead and do a little bit of stretching. And so we're just doing just some stretches right in our chairs. Because a lot of times people believe that you have to go and run a marathon or hike up the Himalayas. And, you know, that's all fine and good at times. but you know, just doing some simple stretches can just kind of get you ready. Um, and it just, any little movement helps. And a lot of times we're working these jobs where we're very sedentary. And so if we could just do things right at our desk that are simple and easy, that helps too. Looks like we're getting a few more people on. So great. Okay. And, all right, so if anyone has any questions, please put it in the chat about high blood pressure. And again, we're going to kind of focus on food. Um, this is the foodie version of the blood pressure boot camp. And I am excited to have a really a world renowned uh, expert, Dr. Kim Williams, who's gonna come and speak to us. And I think we can, if it's okay, Dr. Williams, I'll let you go ahead and, and speak. And then um, we can do the cooking demonstration. Um, sure. Is, is that okay? Okay. Uh, so just want to share my screen. Okay. All right. And let me 
Got that. It's always a little slow when the screen sharing starts. Let's see. So good afternoon, everyone. And share screen. Oh, so it's disabled by the host. That's you. Okay, so you're on mute, so you're on mute and I'm disabled. We're in trouble. <laughs> okay, let me get that. I apologize. Mm -hmm. And I will allow you to, let's see. Okay, can you share? Can can you share it now? Let me give it a shot. Okay. Saving slowly. Yeah, it's whenever I'm trying to share, it just slows down the operation of the system. But hey, that's okay. It's it always comes just slowly. All right. And share the screen. Okay. Can you see me now? Yes. All right. Fantastic. I'm going to minimize the uh, screen for people. All right. I think we're good. All right. So <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to talk for about 30 minutes and open it up for a little bit of questions. I'm sure you have questions on hypertension. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who doesn't either have hypertension or know somebody who had Hyper, have hypertension, or even if you had it at some point uh, and did something good about it, uh, we'd like uh, we'd like to keep your interest, tell you a lot of the background stuff, and and these are hopefully you're taking notes. And you're going to share all of these principles with other people. So you'll notice you'll notice that um, this is one of the longest titles you're you'll ever see in a lecture because there really is a interaction between hypertension, ethnicity, particularly our African-American population, the microbiome, something that you may know nothing about, but you will in 30 minutes, uh, and nutrition. And uh, hi, I'm, I'm Kim Williams. I'm the uh, chairman of medicine here at um, University of Louisville. And I'm one of the authors of these 2017 hypertension guidelines, which every doctor is supposed to know and use for uh, treating uh, people. Okay, so what the background is that the reason that you know somebody with hypertension or you have it yourself is because it's very prevalent. It's probably one of the most prevalent or the it is the most prevalent cardiovascular disease in the world, and it affects a massive number of uh, people in the United States. It is the number one cost um, of uh, for Medicare uh, expenditures or the number one risk factor for heart disease, and it's very modifiable. And it's uh, unfortunately, uh, we have pockets, and I say uh, Appalachia is one of them here in Eastern Kentucky, but in West End, uh, we have uh, people who don't recognize that they have hypertension, it's relatively small. But getting control of the hypertension, that's really an issue that we have to try to do better on. Why is it that we're focusing on this? This may look like it's really medical stuff, but there are things that you should know. Hypertension is a risk factor for a bunch of bad things. It causes heart failure, coronary disease, that's HF, CHD, but LVH, what in the world is that? It's where the ventricle, the left ventricle, which is responsible for pumping blood, if you remember your, you know, your physiology courses and anatomy courses and biology, that muscle gets thick. Now, you know, and why does it get thick? Because it's a muscle and it's being asked to do a big workload. Now, it turns out that if you're asked to do a big workload and you're doing bench presses, you're Arnold, you know, you're Arnold Schwarzenegger up your body and you look like a, you know, a, a very healthy, you know, muscle built person. That is hypertrophy, as it's called, of, of skeletal muscle. When it happens in the heart, we have a problem because we have limitations in the blood supply, as opposed to uh, the muscle, you know, the biceps gets huge, the blood vessel gets big too, but the heart isn't designed that way. It's not supposed to be facing those loads and getting thick. Okay, then how many of us don't know someone who has kidney, chronic kidney disease, uh, or is actually on dial dialysis because they're an end stage kidney disease? Uh, something that's really preventable if we keep the blood pressure low and do all the right things, that will keep kidney health. 
we think of blood vessels as hardening and, and ending up with plaque. And that's a whole different talk that maybe we can talk about some other time, you know, where you get these narrowings. And the narrowings are full of plaque. The plaque is full of fat and cholesterol. The fat and cholesterol comes from what people ate. And so it, interestingly enough, um, this is where nutrition comes in. If we were to fix the blood pressure through nutrition and not put so much cholesterol in the system, uh, we would actually uh, avoid this issue of peripheral vascular disease. You know, people think that these are big fancy terms. They're not. This is where peripheral means, you know, in your legs, typically. Um, vascular means the arteries, the blood vessels that feed the leg. Disease means the narrowing. And how many of us don't know somebody who ended up with a, a, uh, an amputation? because of this disease, peripheral artery disease. So, you know, and that is a major disparity in this country where um, the majority population will get stents and bypasses to get through this plaque. Uh, and African-Americans or poor people tend to get amputations. And we now some of it is the, you know, smoking diabetic. Smoking diabetic with an elevated blood pressure is going to get this disease and going to lose some toes and, and then an ankle and then a leg. And it's totally unnecessary if we do the right things with our lifestyle. Uh, then you have the eyeballs that the, you can actually blow out the retina. It happened to family members of mine where you end up with blindness because you the high blood pressure is so high that it actually damages the eye the eye. And then, of course, what everyone's familiar with is that high blood pressure causes strokes. And I, I really want to talk a lot about that today because it changes how we manage uh, blood pressure and what we think is good in terms of a target for blood pressure. Because of all things, I have plenty of people. You know, so I, if I do the calculation, I've been doing cardiology uh, since 1977. Uh, that's a long time. <laughs> so, um, so for 46 years, I've been doing cardiology, and I've met so many people who said, Dr. Williams, I would rather have a heart attack, heart failure, stroke, amputation, I'm sorry, a heart attack, a peripheral artery disease, amputation, I'd rather have anything other than a stroke. You know, it changes people's lives completely. And so, let's see. Don't know why that came up. Okay, got it. All right. So let's talk about avoiding stroke. But we'd also like to avoid death. And so that's the topic shown here. Um, it turns out that uh, what you're going to know, and you should remember, remember to tell your doctor, because we have a lot of doctors who don't read our guidelines. Uh, and you may have to tell them that for every 20 millimeters of blood pressure, that the blood pressure goes up from 115 for every 20 millimeters, the death rate from cardiac disease actually goes double. And so let's do everything we can to keep that blood pressure down in the very, very low zone. So that brings us to talking about, we're not going to talk a whole lot of scientific trials, but there's one that everybody should know, and still not everybody does. Uh, it was published actually back in 2015. And so eight years later, people are still arguing whether uh, the blood pressure should be 140. Just last week, the American Academy of uh, Family Practice came out with a, a gold blood pressure of 140. I can't explain that. Uh, I've worked with them in the past when I was president of the American College of Cardiology. I understand that doctors get paid more if their patients are controlled. And so they like to, you know, to change the definition of control. Um, but when you look at the data, and this is not, you know, some fly-by-night organization. This was really experts from around the world putting together a trial, publishing it in, in the New England, New England Journal of Medicine. And and what you what did we end up with? That 120 was a whole lot better than 140. Now the point for uh, the American College of Physicians, American Academy of Family Practice, the, pe the people who are not cardiologists, not neurologists, taking care of the heart, taking care of the brain. Uh, those uh, primary care doctors, I understand they would want an easier target, but you have to think of what the cost is to the patient. Okay, so 
in this case, there was about a 37% reduction in bad outcomes if you shot for 120. Uh, by the way, they didn't make it to 120. They get it to, made it to 121. And uh, less than 140, they averaged 136. So that 15 millimeter um, difference really did make about a 37% decrease in heart attack, stroke, and death. And so um, you could you could look at every aspect because you hear people say, well, uh, it's okay for black people to have a higher degree of stroke or a higher degree of blood pressure. That is completely not true. 30% reduction if you, if you did the right thing. Um, and they also say that people are older. It's okay. Not okay at all. And so in every group, you saw a huge improvement. Uh, so I know there are probably too many statisticians in the group, but just if you, you know, want to get a glimpse of it, every time this number is uh, smaller than 0 0.05, it means that it was really important. So all heart failure, death, total uh, cardiovascular death, and and uh, from that is death from heart disease, stroke, as well as to, to alive or dead, all of them were significantly better. Okay, so this is the biggest argument. OK, uh, what you're seeing here is a so-called Kaplan-Meier uh, survival curve. Everybody thinks that that's heavy science, but I knew Paul Meyer. He was my statistics teacher at the University of Chicago. He, had the, he wanted to simplify things that anyone could understand it. So you take a look. Uh, you start off uh, at 1.0. That means 100% of the people are alive uh, at the beginning of the trial. We don't, in, we don't enroll dead people in trials, but we try not to. And then um, we see what happens to them. And this is not just death, but heart attack and stroke, okay? So those three things. And every time somebody has one, the pr proportion or the percentage of people who didn't have it goes down, okay? And you see it going down, 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 down. Well, what happens if you get that people to the lower blood pressure? Yes, people are still gonna have events, but it ends up that at four years, a whole lot fewer people had events a whole lot more people were event free, okay, if you treated the blood pressure intensely. So if your doctor tells you that a normal blood pressure is 140, you got to push back, remember this, write it down, sprint trial, and all of the ACC guidelines say that isn't true. Okay, so if you look at older people, that was true. If you look at frail people, because that's the other people thing, they say, oh, we can't, we don't want to use uh, all the extra pills because that person is so weak already. Turns out that's exactly wrong. You had a huge difference in frail people uh, if you go for the lower target. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there was a time, and I, I, I didn't want to spend too much time talking about why we came, had to do the sprint trial, why we had to write new guidelines. Uh, and it was because we had uh, a rogue guideline uh, that we all rejected and they published it anyway. And the, which said that the blood pressure in older people more than age 60, it's okay for it to be 150. And that was just so wrong. And ever since they, we had had a steady decline using 130 to 140 as a target. We'd had a steady decline over a couple, over decades of, of uh, stroke rate stroke death. As soon as they published this and people, all the doctors took their foot off the gas, you can see the, the stroke rate starting to go up. So um, if your doctor doesn't believe it, tell them to call me. Okay. So yes, as I mentioned, I'm one of the guideline authors. So biased uh, to be, uh, for people to be following them because the data is so clear. Um, the new definition is that normal is actually less than 120. Okay. I notice I'm not talking about diastolic pressures because we kind of devalued them. Uh, if it's high, it's bad for you. If it's low, it's bad for you. So you just ignore it. Okay, but let's pay careful attention to this number, the 120. And if you are 120 to 129, that's so-called um, uh, elevated blood pressure. And uh, if you're above 130, you need to be doing something. Now we can we're going to talk a bit about what that something is. Uh, stage two you know, really should be, you know, uh, being much more aggressive, uh, whether it's 140 or 160. And so what is it that we're supposed to do? Well, if your blood pressure is less than 120, 
you need to be doing a whole food plant-based diet and exercise. If you are 120 to 129, you need to do a whole food uh, plant-based diet and exercise. And we're aiming for, I would aim for 150 minutes of exercise in the normal group, 300 minutes uh, per week in the elevated group. Um, if your blood pressure is 130, 139, and you have a low risk, and you know, uh, Dr. Rondo can tell you how we do the risk. It's with a little uh, uh, app on the iPhone. Uh, if you put in ASCVD, you can put that on your phone, okay? And test all your family members as long as they know their cholesterol and their blood pressure, okay? And their age and, and et cetera. It all goes in. And if your calculation says that you're at relatively low risk, guess what we do? No drugs at 130 uh, to 139. We use uh, exercise and a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, if you have the risk though, it's better to be on the side of whole food plant-based diet plus exercise, plus exercise, plus medication. Okay. And that's true. If you have any of these risk factors, older age, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, uh, or overall risk because your cholesterol is high, or your smoker, that all that stuff that goes into that formula. So please uh, download this app for the Android or the iPhone, ASCVD Risk, and you'll see it. It's free and use it every holiday when you get together with family to tell people to bring their numbers with them if they don't have them off the top of their head. Okay, so in a, a algorithm form, which you can find online, it's actually pretty easy uh, to, uh, uh, sort of see where it is that you're supposed to go with it. It's just rehashing what we said. It's just a little easier to look at it this way. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is get people on medications if they need it. We use diet and exercise if, they, if they're low enough risk. And we want to see people at least every month until they're getting better. And, you know, always take care of the people with chronic kidney disease and diabetes. Okay. So as I mentioned, and I just want to, you know, bring it home again, because several of us are getting to be, you know, 65 and older, uh, we really do want this blood pressure to be less than 130. If, if not, we end up with more heart attack and stroke. Okay, so um, I'm going to, so this one's really talking about um, when we changed the guidelines, people accused us to be, of being in the pocket of the of the drug industry. Are you kidding me? That means that they didn't read the, 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 uh, uh, the paper. Because what we did was say that people need to change their lifestyle. We weren't talking about drugs. And so Paul Muttner, who was the vice chair of our uh, committee, actually uh, compared left and the right, what would happen if we actually, um, people implemented our guidelines. This tiny little group of people here would have had an increase in their medication. Everybody else uh, was going to get controlled with diet and exercise. That's how powerful it is. Before I talk about um, the things that you need to know about diet, I do want to mention uh, that everyone with even a hint of blood pressure elevation on occasion, somebody in your family, Everybody needs to have a blood pressure cuff at home and do out of office home monitoring of your blood pressure. And that is because we have two problems. Everybody's heard of white coat hypertension. Maybe, maybe you haven't, but it's where you go to the doctor, you're anxious, okay? And um, you know, for whatever you're there and the blood pressure is higher than what it really is. And I've seen people get treated to their detriment, okay? because the doctor thought that blood pressure was real. We've been telling people, no, you have to do the blood pressure out of the office, out of the emergency room, get out of the clinic. Okay, now there's an opposite side to this that I have to tell you, it's a little on the sad side, but it's typical of where I grew up on the South side of Chicago, and maybe it's true on the West End as well. If you have poor people, oh, I'm sorry, older people, okay, without a lot of family support, Okay, there is this thing called mast hypertension. That's where the uh, person would come to my office on Virginia Avenue, and it's nice, it's cool. My MAs are treating them nice. The front desk is treating them nice, 
and they have a difficult home life, uh, elder abuse, an abusive spouse, okay? And they're uh, someone always arguing them and upsetting them. The blood pressure can be 30 millimeters lower in my office than it is at home. Well, how do, how do I as a doctor deal with that? Okay, first of all, we take a history and try to make sure that people are in a safe place. Okay, sure. But we also need for blood pressure purposes, I need to know what the blood pressure is at home when they're under stress. And if it's elevated, I treat that, not my office blood pressure. So anyway, two sides to this coin, okay? Home blood pressure monitoring. I can't say it enough. Everybody with, in, in earshot, if you don't have a blood pressure cuff at home, please go get one. Okay, so what's all this stuff that we're talking about? What are we supposed to do with our diet? Which is actually why Dr. Rondo asked me to talk, okay? But there, I have so many other messages that I had to throw all that in here. Um, really important to lose weight, okay? And it's, it's interesting that um, people don't realize that everyone can lose weight. They say that they can't, but you really can. You can go three minutes without oxygen, three days without water, but you go three weeks without food and nothing you know, really bad happens to you, except your weight would go down. And so all the people who say that they can't lose weight is because they're actually eating food. Um, the weight doesn't happen unless you consume calories. So everyone can lose weight. The best way to do it, um, my favorite, it would be like an Ornish diet or Esselstyn diet where people will tell you, eat as much as you want, as long as the whole food no refined grains, no sugar. Uh, you're not concentrating on oil if you're overweight, okay? And if you do a whole food plant-based diet, the weight loss is normal. And I'll talk about why in a little bit. Uh, lowering the sodium, really important to have less than uh, 1800 milligrams of sodium per day. Uh, and for prevent, that's for treatment. For prevention, less than 2300 milligrams. Physical activity we talked about, alcohol raises blood pressure. And smoking, so it does, but not for long because people die when they're smokers. So uh, we, one way to, of lowering the lifetime blood pressure is to shorten the lifetime. We're not interested in that. So please stop smoking if you are a smoker. But let's focus on diet for a moment. It turns out that the more vegetarian you are, even in this very famous trial called the DASH trial, um, they were supposed to be, you know, fix, get, cutting sodium, making sure there's potassium, magnesium, and fruits and vegetables. Um, but it turns out they could actually div divide their people who had gotten their advice and, um, and tried three different types of the DASH diet. If you did animal products, low in fruit and vegetables, you got a fall, but you didn't get much of a fall. If you did more fruits and vegetables and fiber, you fell more. If you did essentially a vegetarian diet, that's when it went down the most. So that was big news in the late 90s, but it shouldn't have been. We knew this. We knew this since before Franklin Roosevelt died of hypertension, heart failure. What, were we, what was he being treated with during World War II? Bed rest, phenobarbital, which was a seizure medication and a, and a sedative. Um, dig digoxin, if anything, that actually increases blood pressure. Aminophilin is great for wheezing. Uh, and intermittent salt restriction, you should have been salt restricted the whole time. And they were saying there was no effective, this is right out of your history book, no effective long-term antihypertensive drug treatment. So we lost a president, okay, uh, because of unwillingness to challenge the medical system that should have known that the original dietary approach to stop hypertension was brought here by this guy, Walter Kempner, in the 1930s. All he did was put people on rice and fruit, okay? The Kempner rice diet, uh, and he would add some tomatoes after a while, and this is what you saw. A dramatic fall in blood pressure, okay? No drugs, just diet, okay? So he didn't know what he was doing other than he thought that animal products are toxic. He was right about that, that there's no place in the human diet or any mammal that doesn't have uh, fangs and claws. None of us are supposed to be eating animal products ever. 
And so whole food plant-based diet worked um, back then, even it was even though it was very restricted. And so we really do recommend a heart healthy diet that, and that would be one that is strictly vegetarian. Um, lowering the weight is important, sodium reduction. And if you are, when you talk about potassium supplementation, it's better to do it in the diet. So how do you get a high potassium diet? Potassium is on the fruits and vegetables. You go to the grocery store, you go to the produce aisle, and when you're done the produce aisle, you go to the cash register. It's real simple. Okay. All right. Really do want everyone to exercise more. Um, and uh, the interesting part is people say they can't exercise. Well, if we start early and get stronger, you will be able to exercise and just gradually work your way up to it. Um, you know, having supervision is, is helping. Having comrades who hold you accountable, that actually works even better uh, if you're not a self-starter. And then alcohol, you know, this is one we regret six years later uh, because the more data came out in 2021 saying, nah, we shouldn't drink at all. It was, you know, causes cancer. So why have it in our guidelines that you could drink a little here and there? It's better to eliminate it completely. So the data on vegetarian diet is a whole lot more than the Kempner and the Dash. This is a massive amount of data saying that if you do any kind of vegan diet, vegan, vegetarian, comparing with omnivore, meaning you're eating pretty much everything in American diet, you see that the blood pressure falls. And every trial is a little different, but if you add them all up together, you're going to see a fall when you stop eating animals and eat more whole food, plant-based diet. Now, why is it? It's because of the microbiome. So I know I have just a couple minutes left, but I just, I want you to at least know that word. So why talk to the micro, to the lay audience about the microbiome? Well, I mean, you've heard some terms that are like really important, like oxygen or water. There are some things that everybody knows in terms of health. Well, this is one of them. And the microbiome is, uh, is something that everyone should be focused on. And I'm gonna talk only about the hypertension uh, and a little bit about TMAO. Okay, so. Now, I know that everyone I'm speaking to is human, but the person sitting next to you may not be. In other words, uh, more than half your body is not actually human. Human cells only make up 43% of the body's cells. What in the world is the rest of it? The rest of it is bacteria, funguses, viruses. And it turns out that they may be small, but they're powerful. And it turns out you could have good bacteria in your, in your GI tract, in the gut, or you could have bad ones. And I'm not talking about the way the poop smells or anything like that. I'm talking about whether or not those uh, particular bacteria will help you digest your food or they'll make it uh, give you uh, gut diseases. Uh, it fixes your immunity. Yeah, and this is, interestingly enough, we found out a, a lot about the bacteria in the GI tract due to the viruses that were going on the last three years with COVID, because none of our, our vegan people died of COVID. Why? Because they didn't have the kind of bacteria that would have this immune response to COVID, so-called cytokine storm that everybody heard about uh, that was killing people and you put them on the respirator and it's attacking their lungs and you put them in the prone position to try to get them to survive. Well, that was all the bacteria in the GI tract. And so the odds of a vegan getting sick was extremely low and dying. No one's actually heard of a vegan dying of, 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 uh, of COVID. And so and it brought its own problems, I should say, which is a whole bunch of vegans saying, well, we don't need the vaccine. No, it's exactly wrong. You're the person who needs it more than anybody else because you're going to get the disease. You won't have any idea that you have it. So get the vaccine, get it and have it be even shorter uh, so that you're not spreading it around with no symptoms. So anyway, I'm off topic a little bit, but it, that's the that's what we do when you have something good. We turn it into something insane, and that's what happened with uh, vegans and COVID. Um, so anyway, back to what we really want to talk about, and that is uh, that that was one great example of how the microbiome can hurt or help. Other examples are in the neuro neurologic category. Well, people getting Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease, all because of the GI tract, that having bad bacteria. And I know it sounds kind of gross when I say it out loud, but there's no easy other way to say it. 
when you eat the carcass of a deceased animal that's decaying flesh, it puts bacteria in your GI tract. And you know if it's Chipotle and E. coli, you get really sick. If it's salmonella, you get really sick. But most of the time, you don't get sick right away. You're putting in there bacteria that end up populating your GI tract because of those animal products. And you end up with all these other chronic illnesses. And that's 80% of our medical Medicare budget is for chronic illnesses that would be eliminated if everybody did a whole food plant-based diet. Okay, so if the microbiome is so important, why don't we do something about it? Well, it turns out we are. Uh, exercise is good. The best thing is a prebiotic, which is a whole food plant-based diet. The probiotics, I just so frustrated with people spending millions of dollars on probiotics that do not work. Someday we have to have the science of getting probiotic pills that will actually get through the gastric, destroying it with acid um, and getting into the GI tract and actually helping people. Um, but you know, hopefully there is some hope. And I do run into a person uh, on occasion who says the probiotics are helping them for some reason. Uh, and that'd be great if it, if it really is getting to their colon where it's important. So someday we're gonna be able to do this. Um, fecal transplant, that sounds, you know, may not sound like an attractive thing to do. It's mostly done between husband and wife. If, if they get a bad set of bacteria like uh, Clostridium difficile, they've got 32 bowel movements a day. They get a transplant from their spouse um, of good bacteria and they can get better. So, uh, and we also know that when you're overweight, if you get a fecal transplant um, from a, an enema of a person who's thin, you'd lose weight. And you could do the reverse too, to get someone to gain weight, give, it, give them the bacteria from an obese person, because it turns out that how you handle food, how much you're absorbing, whether you turn diabetic, what your cholesterol is, all depends on the GI tract and the, what kind of bacteria you had in, have in there. So that, uh, so gonna confine the rest of the talk about high blood pressure. And, you know, we all think of it as being genetic, it probably isn't, uh, you know, it just runs in families because people do the same things in terms of diet. Uh, it could be the environment, no question that stress adds to it, uh, pollution adds to it, uh, hormones and inflammation. Well, guess what? You can actually improve inflammation and, the, and the, uh, your insides uh, and reduce blood pressure if you are doing a high fiber diet with a lot of the minerals that happen in a whole food plant-based diet. So I, I would point out that these are just a couple of, of studies from a couple of years ago. This whole thing is exploding uh, in terms of good, hard-nosed publications evaluating uh, what is the relationship between nutrition, the bacteria in your GI tract, and what kind of uh, disease states you end up with. And you can actually do, and we do them at University of Louisville, a uh, analysis of the microbiome to sign, see if you have the kind of microbes that are gonna keep your blood pressure normal or the ones that are gonna raise your blood pressure. Uh, we know which ones are bad, okay? And these are the bad ones. You don't wanna present, you know, uh, uh, you don't have to learn. There's no quiz at the end of how well you memorize the Latin names, but uh, the ones in red are things that happen when you eat animal products. And the good ones are when you're eating a, a um, fiber-filled plant-based diet. And so uh, we really have good data about this compound. And if there's anybody listening uh, with Dr. Rondo today who is not a whole food plant-based vegetarian, please type in, in addition to the ASCVD risk calculator, uh, I want you to uh, go in your search engine and put in these four letters. And just read about TMAO, that's trimethylamine in oxide. And it turns out that that is a, a toxic compound that comes from eating animals, okay? And it dramatically increases the blood pressure risk. So that risk goes up the higher your TMAO level is. When you go on a whole food plant-based diet, you will dramatically lower that, uh, that risk because your TMAO level will fall. Uh, it comes from eating all kinds of animal products going into the GI tract, and then your, your um, gut flora or the bacteria in your, in your gut turn this compound into the bloodstream 
and your liver tries to get rid of it by oxidizing it. And that just happens to cause, oh, a few things like heart attack, stroke, and death, and high blood pressure and heart failure. So no question that this is something you want to have the lower level of in your bloodstream, not a high level. And that's true for heart failure as well. When you have the highest level, that's those are the heart failure people who survive if it's low and they don't survive if it's high. And so suppose you were to change your, de your diet today, get rid of the red meat, white meat, non, do non-meat protein. What you see is that you will reduce the, the TMAO level within just four weeks. And that's what we see. I tell people to change, who come into me with hypertension, change your diet, come back in three to four weeks, monitor it every day. Uh, and so I don't have to put you on drugs because all we have to do is get you on a whole food plant-based diet. And I just, it would, I feel a little guilty if I didn't mention that, you know, hypertension is the trigger, but how pe many people die is coronary heart disease, heart attack. Still the leading killer of Americans. And the fact is when people are eating red meat or animal protein, they get a lot of chronic kidney disease, stroke, coronary heart disease. And just about anything you uh, get rid of the red meat with will help you, but you're way better off in terms of not dying if you're doing soy or beans or any kind of plant-based protein. They actually do the best. So in summary, uh, what I've gone through with you is a little bit of the controversy of why there's still some doctors out there who aren't following our 2017 gui guidelines, um, but there are things that you should take home from it. Number one, everybody should have a blood pressure cuff at home. Number two, use lifestyle modification. If we do that, lifestyle modification, on, only a few more people will actually need drug treatment uh, in order to get to the new target of less than 130 over 80. All right. And so I would say, uh, you know, we five, you know, it's now six years later after the, after the uh, guidelines were published, we really need to get our quality payment programs to adopt the new targets so that people will stop saying 140. Um, we try to use drugs that are, have proven benefit nowadays, uh, and we would love to see uh, everyone follow our guidelines, and uh, particularly uh, for you, as, uh, as if you're not a healthcare worker, you're at home, have a blood pressure cuff that you can make, uh, uh, and we, you can give your doctor. We, you know, it used to be the doctor tells you your blood pressure. Now it's the other way around. Please, you tell your doctor what the blood pressure is, and that's what you should be treated on. And understand that nutrition is the most important thing that you could do. Exercise is good, but you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. So a whole food plant-based diet, change your microbiome, okay? To the kind of bacteria that are going to make you live longer and healthier life with less cardiovascular risk. All right, and that, uh, I'm gonna stop right there after saying that, you know, we can develop guidelines and we can ask people to do them. This is a projection that was published last year of what would happen if 80% of people actually, you know, recognized the blood pressure that they had it, 80% of them actually um, were being treated, and 80% and of them were actually controlled. It would be this green line down here. We could do better than 80%, but it's going to take hard work. It's going to take your efforts in your community uh, and in your family to change everybody's diet, have everyone exercising, get the extra weight off, no smoking. They're not really hard to do. And the benefits to our population would be tremendous uh, because this gap here is millions and billions of dollars of healthcare uh, money that's wasted right now trying to fix diseases that shouldn't exist. And we don't have adequate roads, bridges and education for the poor. So please, uh, let's get on the, the green line. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will uh, stop right there and uh, answer questions. If there's any time left, I probably took up the whole thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. I, I have a question. Sure. So I put my question in the chat, but I will try to remember. Okay. So I said that I never realized how much 
the biome had such an influence, such an influence in the, in our health. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you've heard about the popular thing where people do this cleansing. <laughs> yep. Can you tell me whether that is actually a good and a positive thing to do or not? So it sounds like it would be really good. And, you know, just fix your microbiome. The problem is it's never had any positive association with any peer-reviewed literature. What are you supposed to do in medicine? Like, you know, a COVID vaccine or a polio vaccine. You do the, the intervention and you do so-called placebo um, and you yes. compare the two groups. There's no data that the cleansings actually work. And I know I'm making a lot of my vegan friends mad because they, but the fact of the matter is if it's so good, do the trials, prove that it works so that everybody can have it. In the meantime, the in, in theory, it actually wouldn't work. Why? Because a person will have a cleanse and then they go back and eat the things that put the bad bacteria there in the first place. So how about we fix the diet? And then, you know, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that if you were to do that, fix the diet, then that four weeks I was talking about to get your TMAO level down, I bet it would be shorter. I bet it would be significantly shorter if you could do the cleanse as people were cleaning up their diet, clean it from above and below. Ah, thank you so much. Theory. That's a theory. If I, if I say that out loud, I gotta do it, you know, I gotta do a trial to, <laughs> to make sure it's true. That's really cool, Dr. Rondo. <laughs> it was like we're all in the classroom. I have another question. Yes. We're, we're learning a lot. So yeah, I thought I'd change the view. <laughs> Indeed. So you want me to go through the the um, the ones that I see? Um, check home, blood pressure at home. Uh, had, can two people use the same cuff? Certainly. Um, if you don't trust them, you can always take a little alcohol and, and, and clean it. Uh, there, you won't destroy it by uh, wiping it with rubbing alcohol. Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Williams? Now, this yes. is your opportunity. Dr. Williams is world renowned and he actually wrote many of the guidelines, if not all of them. Um, <laughs> So yes, I have another question. Okay, yes. So can you tell me or speak a little bit about the basis of the stereotype that Black people can tolerate higher negative values like blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera, and lower positive things like hemoglobin, hematocrit, those things. So that's turned around completely in the last three or four years. Uh, the biggest example was the uh, um, the renal disease formula for uh, a GFR, which is glomerular filtration rate, glomerular filtration rate, which is how good are your kidneys getting rid of bad stuff in your bloodstream? And it, they always had this formula. Well, if you're African American, this is normal, and if you're white, it's not. Well, that was always wrong. And it was one of the major reasons why we are 12% of the population and 35% of the dialysis patients. And that has been changed at every major university and um, all of the guidelines. I, I, I'm sure there's some guy, some you know, places that haven't changed yet, but certainly uh, Quest has changed, uh, UofL has changed, you know, LabCorp has changed. So hopefully everybody will realize that you know, the, there are some genetic differences between uh, more than just pigment. That is, uh, if you are uh, Jewish, Ashkenazi Jewish, there's a Tay-Sachs disease. If you're Black uh, from, you know, West Africa, there's a fair amount of sickle cell, sickle cell trait. There's um, a couple of, there are a couple of uh, gene changes in pretty much every group. But other than that, we are 99.99999% the same as every, you know, you may look completely different, but you're basically the same. And so that whole idea that, you know, uh, we should tolerate anemia better, all of this stuff was just wrong. Yeah, there's even one that talks about the pulse ox is uh, different for us. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, but but with that, doesn't the, our pigmentation, doesn't that play somewhat of a role with that? Pigmentation um, can actually hide uh, hypoxia. And uh, hopefully everyone has gotten to the point where uh, they understand it. They could do a couple of different sources, use the earlobe, um, avoiding fingernail, going through fingernail polish when you have darker skin is a good idea too. So uh, the, the toxic compound that comes from eating animals, the TMAO, is that mm -hmm. something, I, that's the first time I'm, I'm learning. So um, it's the first time I've ever heard of that particular uh, substance. Is that something that we can actually check yep. in the yep. office? We do. Um, so it is a send out. Uh, Lab Corp may have it. Quest has it because they bought Cleveland Labs. This came out of the Cleveland Clinic starting about 2012. And they finally commercialized it right before I did that church trial on the south side of Chicago. So it would have been uh, 2019. And in fact, uh, since I wasn't working with Cleveland Labs, uh, so I did a, a trial uh, for Lent. And I think it came out commercially available a month before that. So yeah, it's uh, it should be available. You should be able to order it in, in Epic. or um, I, I haven't tried it, but I will be trying it because we're going to do another trial. That's what, that was my next question is how do you use it when you do uh, check that how you know is that something that you use to convince people of a more you know pescatarian or just more vegan kind of you know meal plan how do you how do you envision using that 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 test I'm actually using it as a research tool just to prove to people that they shouldn't be eating animals <laughs> and so and what happens so we you know a five week intervention on the south side of Chicago 50 church people you know yes I was cheating because people on the south side of Chicago in a church tend to give up something for Lent and we asked them if we feed you three meals three vegan meals a day will you give up eating animal products and 50 people said yeah and so we did the blood test before and after and you saw a dramatic fall in everything uh, actually, since I have this, these slides up, I could actually show it to you. Uh, because Christ, oh, that's the same thing. Okay, I will. Can you get in? Are you oh, able to share? Share screen again. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay. There we go. Okay. Anyway, this is where that I was, this was the introduction to that talk about the guidelines and the church trial. So I had this pause on it because I might as well just tell you. The worst part of writing guidelines is being ignored by your colleague. So this is, this was actually um, uh, the data from Rush three years after we wrote those guidelines to say everybody needs to do a vegetarian diet. Well, the American Heart Association, Asian fish, the pesco vegetarian diet would be considered acceptable by the guidelines, not optimal, but acceptable. And we had 11 people, 274 actually doing that. And then I came to Louisville and I was asked to speak at uh, a medical conference, the American Society of Drumroll, Preventive Cardiology, and this is what they were feeding the doctors. And wow. Processed meat, sausage, ham, bacon, uh, lunch meat, and what else is processed? Um, those are actually World Health Organization class one carcinogens, uh, meaning that they cause cancer. And they're uniquely associated with heart attack, stroke, and heart failure. Um, and eggs increases mortality if you eat more than a half an egg a day. And so this didn't look like a half an egg to me. So anyway, um, uh, going backwards to what you're asking me, this is what I was going to try to show you. I just got distracted <laughs> to, to, to complain out loud about our population, including doctors, ignoring good, healthy guidelines. There it is. TMAO went down 43% by quitting uh, eating the South Side of Chicago diet and eating a whole food plant-based diet that was shipped frozen uh, three meals a day for five weeks. Insulin level fell. That really meant the weight fell. Uh, the cholesterol measures, the inflammation, 
uh, the sugar, the um, one of the more powerful one was everyone's heard of the A1C uh, that tells you how much blood sugar you've had over the past few few weeks. It went down and it looks like a small amount, but that's just because the numbers are small. It happened in everybody. So this was one of the stronger uh, associations. So the, if you want to get all the risk factors that we can measure to go away, just don't eat any more animal products and, and don't eat refined grains. Don't eat sugar and juices. You do a smoothie instead of juicer. What's the difference between a smoothie and a juice? The fiber is still there when you do a smoothie, okay? And the fiber ends up in the garbage when, uh, when it really is the thing that changes your microbiome. So there you have it. Um, can you talk about the dangers of low blood pressure? Hmm. Um, so when the blood pressure is too low, uh, and if you have good blood vessels too low, it would probably be in the 70s. There are normal people running around in the 80s, uh, 90s. I know I'm African-American male and over 60, and my blood pressure is typically 102, 104, but that's because of the plant-based diet. If the blood pressure is really low, particularly on standing, the big... The big problem is not kidney impairment, which people think it would be. The big problem is getting dizzy, falling, and hurting something. So that that really is an, is an issue. Um, so uh, it, when do I see it as a cardiologist? I do see it when people don't do what the guidelines say, that, but they're not monitoring the blood pressure every day. And they're still taking medications for a disease they don't have anymore. So I've had several people, one passing out in a car, uh, one guy, you know, he was just feeling really bad and went to his primary care doctor who said, oh, your blood pressure is 80, 80 over 60. You better start eating meat again so you can take your medication. Take your medication. The doctor actually said that. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dr. Um, Williams, what about the um, the effect that vitamin D has on a high blood pressure? So not as much as we thought. So 10 years ago, everybody was all over vitamin D, uh, thinking that it, it was the major cause of all kinds of cardiovascular disease, including hypertension. It turned out to be nothing. In randomized trials, it has it no has effect on cardiovascular uh, outcomes, blood pressure, or anything else. It's good for your bones. I think it's good for your immune system as well. That is one of the risk factors for having a bad COVID outcome was having a low vitamin D level. Was that independent of not exercising? When people are exercising, they go outdoors to get more vitamin D. So it might've been an association that had nothing to do with causality. Does anyone have any more questions for Dr. Williams? So we're oh, all gonna be, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, is fish and salmon some, is a good food to have in your diet if, if prepared properly or not? Uh, uh, absolutely not. Um, not. Absolutely not. And um, you're hitting on a sore point here. Okay, so so oh. let me, let me uh, do I have two minutes, Dr. Rondo? Okay. All right, let me go back to the slides. This is the... I, I think that this is one of the most misinterpreted trials in the history of trials. And so I'm backing up in my talk um, about 15 slides to get to the Mediterranean diet, which was the setup was they asked people who were, uh, 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 they asked people who were on a general, um, med uh, in the Mediterranean area, to change their diet, okay, so that there's no more red meat, and they were using predominantly, uh, let's see, I, there's no way I went by it. Yep, I could have, okay, I may have to search for it. I'm going to find that Predimed trial for you. Okay, one second, give me a moment. It's only 200 slides to find. I'll get there. Okay. There it is. Okay. All right. So do I still have the screen? 
Uh, I think you're on mute. Yes, you should still have the screen. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Share. Okay, so this is the very famous trial. I really congratulate the authors. What they showed that everyone, including US News and World Report, just a few weeks ago, came out saying that this is the number one diet for human health. Are you kidding me? So what they did is they stopped eating red meat, put everybody on fish with a little poultry here and there, all right? And so the control group continued to eat the red meat. And as you can see, the that you know Kaplan Meyer plot that I told you was so simple. You start off with nobody has an event, and then the events accumulate. And you can see the black line, the controlled diet with red meat, the events, which is heart attack, stroke, and death, happened more frequently than it did with the Mediterranean diet. And they did split the Mediterranean diet into two groups, by the way, extra virgin olive oil sent to their house. Please use a tablespoon of this every day. And nuts, please use a handful of these nuts every day. And so as you can see, those two weren't any different. But the, overall, it was a 30% reduction when you change from red meat to fish, all right? That is what everybody remembers about the trial. But what I'm asking is, when you see a publication that's important, well done study like this one, and it's in the New England Journal of Medicine, why not just spend two more minutes and read the whole article? If they did read the whole article, they'd see this one down here that the death rate was no different in any of the three groups, okay? And if we move over to table three, which I'm blowing up for, they would see that that 30% heart attack, stroke, and death was actually driven only by stroke. The stroke reduction, particularly controlled diet versus nuts, was hugely decreased, but even versus extra virgin olive oil, it was decreased. Myocardial infarction, MI for short, is the technical medical name for a heart attack. There was no difference. Changing from red meat to fish does not change your heart attack rate. Death from cardiovascular causes, there was no difference. Death from any cause, there was no difference. I mean, handful, small number, not significant, were better on the red meat than they were on the fish. So what is this big change to the Mediterranean diet? If I was a neurologist, I'd be all over this because decreasing stroke and code stroke and trying to get in there and do the clot busting drugs and you know all the stuff that neurologists go through, being cut by 30%, I could breathe again, great. But I'm not a neurologist. I'm a, I'm a first, I'm a human being. I wanna know if people are alive or dead. And I'm a cardiologist and having people die of heart disease and, cardi and have heart attacks at the same rate means this diet is completely worthless. So please let everybody know because everybody's saying, including cardiologists, saying, uh, and so, and when you, when you ask me, well, since you wrote the guidelines, how did fish end up in the guidelines uh, at all? And the answer is the American Heart Association, guess what? They're a stroke organization. What can I say? I mean, if the fish does reduce stroke, but for the rest of us, for American College of Cardiology, this doesn't help us at all. Okay, all right, more than you wanted to hear, but hopefully everybody got that message. Um, and if if you if you still want to eat that salmon or anything, um, there's a wonderful. Um, uh, um, I, I always switch over to animal rights and environment when people push back on the vegan diet because it's killing the planet and hurting the environment. And there's, um, I, I just really struggle with actresses' names. Um, I think it's Kate Winslet, Titanic. If you, so their third Google assignment is to, is to pull up her name and the documentary is something like eating to extinction or something like that. You'll see that eating fish is killing you and it's killing the environment at the same time. So two birds with one stone, I mean, the, you, nobody should be eating fish. Wow, I think we're all just stunned. I know I am. It's just data, largely ignored with data. <laughs> all right. I, wow, wow. Um, one more question, and that is, um, 
you know, we're, we're talking about high blood pressure. And of course, this is Black History Month. And so historically, there is a question as to whether the um, there's a relationship with the people who came over with the transatlantic slave trade and high blood pressure, because from what I can see in my research, people who are, um, you know, directly, you know, from the, from Africa do not have the same rates of high blood pressure like uh, the descendants of slaves. So could you speak to that? So um, uh, here, I, here I have to admit, I did the 23 and Me, and I look, you know, like a mixed race African American, right? Turns out my uncle and the albinism, my dad had a recessive form of it. He had less pigment than his mother and father. I have less pigment than my mother and father, and then I have a kid who has less than me. Turns out I have that albinism gene, and guess what? I am 73% Sub-Saharan African, okay? I should be really dark-skinned. And sure enough, uh, on a not sodium-restricted diet, freshman medical student under stress, 1975, my blood pressure was 140 over 90. But I had a freshman physiology book in my hand, <laughs> and I turned and I looked and I read it up about sodium and the Goldberg kidney and all this stuff. And so I cut the sodium out of my diet. It immediately went down to 125, 128. Fast forward 25 years when I found out about my cholesterol being elevated and I went vegan, not knowing all of this vegan blood pressure stuff that I presented today, because most of it hadn't been published. My blood pressure went to 104 and it's been there ever since. So that aging blood pressure, that's for meat eaters. You don't age with blood pressure, okay? And so, yes, uh, I assume that I am one of those people that you're talking about. Uh, I, I traced back my Louisville roots, actually, uh, to, to where my, uh, the, the slavery, um, my grandmother, my great grandmother, uh, Grandma Battle, was actually the daughter of slaves. She was born in 1880. Okay. And so many people in my family had high blood pressure. And the, the, what you were, for, for, for those of you who didn't understand what Dr. Rhonda was talking about, is the idea that uh, we are descended from the survivors of the slave trade. That is, if you put all these people in the boats like sardines uh, and they would die of dehydration unless they were able to conserve sodium, then they would be able to conserve their volume and stay alive, all right? And so we were all, you know, supposed to be sodium sensitive people. Now, that has been argued back and forth and mostly forth, uh, most, I'm sorry, mostly back, uh, that it's just not true. I tend to believe there's something to it. Not that black people have higher blood pressure, but that black people have higher blood pressure on bad diets that have a lot of sodium. So I think we you know, we do have some sodium sensitivity, but it, but you know there's a lot of other things in the bad diet, the saturated fat, the the refined grains that increase every time you eat a pretzel or white bread or you know Italian bread, you know you end up with a insulin spike. Insulin puts plaque in your arteries and stiffens your arteries, and your blood pressure goes up. Uh, in addition to the the effects of the central obesity and diabetes, so. Uh, you know, so, and there is data, by the way, that says that the refined grains are actually worse than meat. You'd be better off um, that eating cows, not for the cow, of course, uh, than, than you would be eating refined grains and sugar. I think you're on mute again, Dr. Rondo. There you go. Sorry about that. Wow, Whew. that's a lot. That is a lot. So um, does anyone else have any questions um, at all for this world-renowned cardiologist who has just stunned us all? And well, we all have to think about uh, becoming uh, less meat eaters and you know, even with the fish, because that data is very compelling. Um, you know, and but you know, that's what this is all about, learning learning more information and using that information, not just for our own education, but using it as a tool for transformation, transforming our lives and making sure that we 
you know, live the best quality lives that we possibly can. But this information, I have to say, it, it, it's uncomfortable, you know, especially on a day like uh, Super Bowl Sunday, when we're all about not only football, but eating good food. So uh, very hearty food. Now, I, I have one question, you know, when you talk about animal uh, products, you know, we think of the meat, but what about just, you know, like butters and, you know, things that come from the animal that aren't ac actually their flesh? So, so, so really, I'm going to show my slide, show my screen again, because that slide is right up there. All right. Okay. Question on the table. Are there any safe animal products? The, the answer is no, um, unless, let's see. Okay. There we go. Here's one of them. Ooh, come on. There's uh, going to start about chronic kidney disease. Got to show you this data. Uh, or I could just tell you about it. Well, this is actually one of them. That's actually the COVID data. Vegans don't die. Um, okay. All right. I'm going to have to go back and search for it. I could just tell you that there is a lot of data. It comes mostly from Harvard. There it is. Oh, it was coming. Come on. Okay. All right. Um, and it started off with Harvard. And it's it's interesting. Um, you can so you can see that. And this is, you know, this is not some vegan propaganda journal. This is Journal of the American Medical Association. It's one of the hardest I've tried. It's one of the hardest journals to get published in. Association of Animal and Plant Protein Intake with All Cause Mortality. What they basically did is take this massive amount of data, 131,000 people. Where do they come from? Doctors and nurses. Okay. They isolated the people with some unhealthy risk factor like obesity, smoking, something like that. Okay. And this is what they found that then what you're doing is saying, what, let's see what everybody ate, see what, how fast they died. And then this model, let's, let's put it into a computer model. And let's just say, what would happen if everybody changed just 3% of their animal protein, replace it with plant protein? And the results were dramatic. So what it said is that poultry and fish kill you, but they kill you a little less than dairy. Dairy is a little less than red meat. Red meat is a little less than eggs. And eggs is a little less or a lot less than processed red meat. Okay. Now, it was very similar with the... Um, with the cardiovascular disease. I mean, dead is dead. So maybe we shouldn't even bother splitting it out into cardiovascular, you know, heart attack, stroke, that heart failure versus cancer. But there was one thing that everybody should know. And that is when, I know we talked a little bit about statistics, but if these, this horizontal line here, this tells you how much, okay, uh, death you could avoid. So for eggs, 0.88, that, that's a 12% reduction, okay? But that one didn't reach statistical significance, meaning that you couldn't count on it. Why? Because there are less people. Why? Because they died of cancer from eating eggs. So please don't eat any eggs. But the body, I, I'm sticking to the whole idea that dead is dead. Therefore, there are no safe animal products. They're just different degrees of danger. Uh, and yes, in this particular study, uh, fish and poultry were, and, and again, that's a little different than that Mediterranean stuff I showed you, right? It, where it said that fish did not save any lives. This is 30 years of outcomes in doctors and nurses. So, you know, so you have to leave some room for differences. All right, so anyway, if you don't believe Harvard, okay, fine. If you don't believe doctors and nurses, fine. Is this a mistake to JAMA, pub, JAMA publish the same title a second time? They did. It was three years later. And, but it was Japanese data, the J Japan Public Health Center Prospective Study Group. And again, it was a massive number of people, not quite as big as the Harvard study, but 71,000, and basically showed the same thing. Look at that cardiovascular disease. Red meat kills. Processed red meat kills about the same. I don't know why their red meat is so much worse than it is in the United States. Uh, but there, every every animal protein source increased mortality, or it would decrease it if you got rid of it. Okay. Next slide. Whoa. 
Same title, same journal. This was the following year, 2020. And this is yet a third group. Is it somebody we don't trust? Is our National Institute of Health, a AARP. I don't know how many AARP members we have here, but they actually do research. And what they found uh, over 20, was that 25 years, okay, was every animal product in what you're looking for, as I mentioned before, is something less than 0.05. And this one is, and every, there's so many relationships, cancer, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, that are so much better if you just substitute 3%, just get rid of some of your animal products, but why not get all, get rid of all of them? And this is, this is the largest of the studies. And I'm sorry, what, Dr. Williams, are you yep. showing, are you sharing your screen? Does anyone else see us? Yeah, I am sharing. Well, I, I don't see anything. I don't see, I don't see your screen. Oh. So, all right, well, it's worth going back. All right, so, okay, so you can see it now. So this yes. was the data and it was showing, I was showing you the, that there are no safe animal products. It's just that some are safer than others. This was the Japanese data uh, showing basically the same thing. And this is the AARP study, uh, all with the same title, Three different publications, three different big sources. This is the largest study. You know, uh, this is what four hundred thousand people, uh, and it's it basically showing that red meat protein, egg protein, you name it. If it's animal protein, it increases your death rate. Okay, all right. So, no safe animal products. Oh, oh boy. All right. This data. That okay. is the data. Yeah. We can't, I guess we can't argue with the data, but you know, mm -hmm. it, it's there. It's whew, that that's a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, um, for participating in this uh blood pressure boot camp, the foodie version. You have really uh been amazing in terms of the information. And I think this falls in line with the things that we're doing today also. If anyone still has time, I know we've gone over time, um, but we still you know, can, can zoom on. We are gonna be doing a food demonstration or a cooking demonstration. So um, if anyone would like to you know, participate, still stay on. But thank you so much again, Dr. Williams, for the great information. And we'll, we'll just to let you know, all the things that we're uh, showing today are all vegetable, fruit and vegetables and no animal products other than, yeah, there's no animal products at all. So yeah, yeah. we're actually doing a broccoli, um, a broccoli salad. And then we also have a, gua a wonderful guacamole that my daughter makes. Oh, so, wonderful. Okay. Yep. So, so everybody paid to get in, right? They knew there was a cost to this? <laughs> cost to it. <laughs> Cost is you have to promise to have a home blood pressure kit and measure it now and measure it three weeks later after you've done a whole food plant-based diet and then report back to you what the difference is. All right. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. That's a part of that boot camp. So yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for enough. the wonderful information. Thank you. All mm -hmm. right. So we're going to continue on with the blood pressure boot camp. I hope you know, others can actually stay on. We're just going to do a really quick uh, cooking demonstration. And uh, so I'm going to move over here. I'm actually in my kitchen right now. And I uh, chopped up some broccoli. Hold just a moment. I'm going to take my computer on over here. Actually, I'm going to get on my phone. And we're going to, because it's easier for me to maneuver around on my phone instead of, so hold just one moment. Okay. Can I interrupt you while you're while you're setting up, Dr. Rondo? Yes. Um, so I'm actually going to put in a link to um, since I challenge people to change their diet, I'd like to give you some resources, and here it is. I'm putting That's great. To the Black Cardiologist Vegan Cookbook. What? That's amazing. All right, there it is. It's free. 
All right. Take care, everyone. Right, Thank bye. you, Dr. Williams. Bye-bye. All right. So, wow, that's a great resource. Um, so go ahead and go into the chat and uh, I'll actually uh, copy that link. So I can send that also if, if, if people are not able to pull that up. So what I'm gonna do, let me just change this here. Oops, oh, nope, that's not what I want. I'm trying to flip my camera around, hold on. Okay, so no background, okay. Okay, so we're gonna make a, so this is my cooking demonstration. And um, so already have chopped up broccoli, just fresh broccoli, chop that up. And I'm gonna put that, let's see, I have my phone. So, oh, just one moment, I'm gonna wash my hands so I can practice what I preach. So we're gonna just make a quick broccoli a salad. And I'm gonna show you the ingredients, which I think Dr. Williams, you know, I had heard that he was a big, uh, you know, proponent on plant-based foods. I didn't realize it was like that. Woof, can't have nothing. And I thought at least maybe fish. What y'all think? I thought the same I thing that off my world with that fish. <laughs> yes, I'm like, what? I thought fish Lord, was good. Was, me too. I, you know, but, but so what he's saying though, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it's maybe a little bit better, but it's not, it still doesn't give you, you know, uh, as much of, in terms of decreasing your risk for cardiovascular disease, like being a vegan, you know, strict vegan. So, whoo, that's a lot. Okay, so we've got are so I like I said I chopped up some uh, broccoli and then I've got some these are my other items I have um, apple cider vinegar I have some sunflower seeds I have uh, craisins dried cranberries and then I've got some jet puff a uh, marshmallow cream and then da, 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 where is the okay where did it go oh it's over here on my, okay, here we go. And I think he would really love this. This is vegan dressing and spread. Yes, I just happened to have this, Hellman specifically, and it's vegan. So it is, I'm assuming it's kind of like a soy-based type of thing, but that's one of the things that's important too is um, for us to become better at reading labels. So when we're dealing with high blood pressure, going on and reading the labels like, um, you know, like this, of course, this vegan yeah. bag, and I want to make sure that it didn't have too much sodium or salt, which is, you know, that's one of the things that we focus on here. And so I looked at the sodium or the salt intake, and uh, it's not that bad. It's like 100 milligrams um, with one tablespoon. So if I'm going to, you know, add four <laughs> tablespoons to this thing, I, which I think I'm just going to probably do about two tablespoons, I'm going to get 200 milligrams of sodium or salt. When I saw that, I said, okay, he's an athlete. He's committed. I'm competitive. The nature of me was just still just thinking about the game that I just wanted to know. Like, you know, we win. Like, I said, okay, hold on. Let me get back to. Um, But around the league, everyone is expressing their love and admiration for you and everything that you went through. So what would it be like for you to see that outpouring of love from the community that you were part of? I couldn't even believe it. It just showed the unity of our league and the entire world, you know? And I really feel like the whole situation showed that we can all come together. It was just a surreal moment. Over 70,000 on Look, him. I'm sorry, can you mute? <laughs> Your phone, please. In the playoffs, that second divisional round game was against Cincinnati. Can you mute your phone? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it really did. It really did. Um, just playing them again. Um, and...
Mm -mm. Okay, so um, so I've got that vegan um, Hellman's uh, spread dressing and spread. So I'm gonna add that to my broccoli. Okay, nice. And so that's probably about three tablespoons. So I'm gonna, uh, I think that's probably gonna be enough. And then I'm gonna add about the same amount of the jet puffed marshmallows. So I'm gonna add, let me see, just a little bit more. So you know that marshmallow clean, and sometimes it's kind of hard to get off. So we use this. And so we're going to kind of mix that up real good. And then once I mix that, and a lot of times what I'll do when I make this, I'll actually add the marshmallow cream and the, uh, the, the dressing together before I add it uh, to the uh, broccoli. Okay, so, and then I'm gonna add just a small amount of apple cider vinegar. So again, I'm gonna look at to see how much sodium or salt is in this. And so there is zero, okay? And, Again, sodium or salt is you know, very, very important when it comes to uh, blood pressure. We really wanna avoid a lot of it, okay? So I'm just gonna add, that was just maybe a couple of teaspoons of the apple cider vinegar, okay? Gives it kind of a nice little kick. Um, so next is going to be the cran cranberries for dried craisins. And so I'm gonna add a few of these. It adds a nice little sweetness to it, okay? And again, we wanna be label readers uh, as we are you know, making any of our items. So again, I'm looking for the sodium or salt. Not to say that you, know, you don't look at other things, but again, we're focused on um, blood pressure. So we're looking at the sodium and, and the salt. You also sometimes wanna look at, or actually all the time, you wanna look at the carbohydrates. And so that's important as well, the sugar intake as well. Now, so I'm gonna go ahead and mix this up real good. Mm, that's looking good. And you know, I actually got this recipe from when I worked at Norton, we used to have a lot of caterers coming through. And this lady made this broccoli casserole or this broccoli salad. And you know, I you know, wasn't real crazy about broccoli at the time. I've come to really enjoy broccoli, especially since my daughter's been in the world. And so, um, so, but anyway, so she gave me this recipe and I've just loved it ever since. Okay, so this is the kicker. Now this is sunflower seeds or kernels, unsalted. Yes, yes, yes. No salt in these uh, sunflower seeds. So that's really important because a lot of times you can't get the sunflower seeds that's salted. So we're gonna add, uh, I actually like, I like the crunchiness of it. So you have kind of like the, the crunchiness of the broccoli. Now I always use fresh broccoli because I kind of like that crunch. I don't get the ones that are frozen. I guess you could, but I just, I like the fresh ones. You get that crunch and you get that sweetness that occurs with the uh, dried cranberries. And then you get just a little bit more sweetness with that marshmallow. And then you get a little bit of the creaminess with the marshmallow and the, the spread. And then the apple cider vinegar gives you kind of like that kick as well. So more crunch, yes, yes. And that is with the, uh, the sunflower seed kernel. So we're just mix, just real good, real, real good, okay? And so sometimes you have to kind of mix it up a little bit more because the, uh, the, the uh, puff, jet puffed marshmallow cream can sometimes, you know, just cause it to be a little bit more sticky. So there we are. Um, I think Dr. Williams would approve of this recipe. I think, I hope. And so, um, and that's real quick. It, it didn't take, the, the, the thing that took the longest was just basically chopping up the broccoli. So they didn't take long at all. So that is a great recipe um, that you can have um, for, for any real you know, occasion overall. So that's what we have right there. And um, and another thing that I just wanted to show everyone, you know, during this boot camp, um, we're just going to go over here, and you know, lots of fruit. You know, just make sure that you have that all around. And you're just showing you a little bit in my kitchen. 
And so here I've got my bananas, I've got my uh, avocados, which they're, those are pretty ripe. I've got some ones over here that uh, my guacamole specialist is about to uh, turn this into an amazing guacamole. So she's gonna take some avocado and some other items and make a wonderful guacamole. And you know, what is Super Bowl without guacamole? You know what I'm saying? Okay, so here I also have, and again, I'm right here in my kitchen and I keep them out. I keep out my fruit um, because it's beautiful and it, it's reachable, you know, it's accessible. So that's one of the things I do advise too, is just keep those fruits and vegetables where you can see them um, and where you can access them. And that does help, okay? And I'm gonna go over here and again, I've got my fruit. I've got some bananas, I've got some strawberries, and then I've got some blueberries over here. Mm. And actually blueberries are one of the fruits that have a really high antioxidant count. And they're really, really good in terms of just, you know, not only the taste, but health-wise, antioxidants, like I mentioned, it helps with inflammation and actually helps you with your brain power as well. So it's like one of those superfoods. I think bananas, um, uh, the uh, blueberries, and actually I thought sa salmon was, but according to Dr. Uh, Williams, I don't know about that, but you know, maybe it still is when it comes to like memory, you know, uh, good attributes, but when it comes to cardiovascular disease, it sounds like my wonderful guacamole uh, uh, personnel is getting herself ready to show us how she makes a guacamole. One thing that's important as well is to look at portion sizes. And so this is a whole little um, visual aid that I like to I have that shows the sizes for everything. Like we talk about the sizes um, or, you know, like what a serving is. And so many people incorrectly estimate the amount of food in a portion. Portions, excuse me, that are too large can add hundreds of extra calories each day. Not just a few, but hundreds. Um, so, and that can lead to weight gain. Of course, the weight gain can then contribute to increasing your blood pressure. So what we have is like models of everyday objects that help us to visualize actually how much food in terms of portions we should be following. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you here is portions. So if you're eating one cookie, that's basically the size of like a yo-yo, okay? That's what this is. So this is a cookie. And this is the size of the yolk. So one cookie. So you know how we get them big old cookies at Crumble Cookie or you know all those different places. They are huge. They're about three, four times this size. Okay. So when you're looking at how many calories, um, how much sugar something has in it, they're talking about this size of a cookie. So if you have three times the size of that, you got to times that by three. Okay, so it's really important for us to know serving sizes. So one cookie, it's the size of a little yo-yo, okay? Now, three ounces of cooked lean meat, which I know a lot of us aren't gonna, not a lot, but maybe a few of us aren't gonna be eating as much. So that's the size of it. And you know how we be eating our meat and eating our chicken and stuff like that? The size of a card or a deck of cards, that's it. That's it. Yep. So that is the meat, okay? Three ounces of cooked meat. And that is considered a portion size, you know, of what we should be eating. Now, this here is a half a cup of cooked pasta. And it's the size of a mouse, not a, you know, animal mouse, but, you know, what we use in our computers. So that's that. So, so knowing portion sizes is super, super important super important, okay? So putting that back in there and an ounce, 
So an ounce is actually the size of dice. Okay. So that's what that is. Just like rolling of the dice or well, actually, it's it's really like domino the you know figure figures from dominoes. So that's what that is, and that's an ounce, like an ounce of cheese. That's what that represents. Okay, a teaspoon of butter or margarine. Now that is dice right there. That's one dice. Okay, so that is a teaspoon. So if we're visualizing what you know. If we're saying, oh, okay, it just takes a teaspoon of butter or margarine, that's how much. And you know, we be using big gobs of stuff, okay? Two tablespoons of like peanut butter is the size of a golf ball, okay? And that's what this is here, a golf ball, little brown golf ball. Okay, and then one pancake is the size of a CD, okay? Size of a CD, Oops. not a record player, y'all, okay, CD. And then three ounces of cooked fish is like a checkbook, okay? That's that size here. And, but I think this is probably gonna be, you know, we can liberalize these sizes because this is fruit and vegetables. So um, a half a cup of cooked vegetables, like what we just, you know, talked about with the broccoli, is um, the size of a, a light bulb, about the size of a light bulb, okay? So that's a piece of fruit. I mean, so that's a vegetable. And then this is a piece of fruit is basically a medium piece of fruit is the size of a baseball, okay? All right. So our wonderful guacamole maker is ready and she is going to talk us through this amazing fruit um that she is making today so there she is so a lot of people think that guacamole is like a vegetable but it's actually a fruit i didn't know that until like a few years ago so i'm gonna be showing you how to make like a guacamole bowl i do this whenever like i'm hungry i want something fast and quick i even take it for my lunches so this is what it looks like when the finishing project but the things that you need is sea salt onion powder guacamole and tomato so avocado and, oh yeah avocado so what you want to do i already have my tomatoes cut up you want to wash them first and then you want to cut if you them. wash your hands didn't you? yes mm -hmm. and then you want to cut into seconds or how however small you would like them i like i like different sizes so you get the you wash this off and then you get the avocado you have it in half and then you just keep on going and you wanna make a full circle. Ooh. And so Ooh. as you can see, the, the seed in the guacamole, the avocado actually is very small. So I made it a lot easier. So just take the seed out that's one of the smallest seeds I've ever seen. Yeah. Normally the guacamole, I'm sorry, the avocado seed is like, like a big, almost looks like a, a little smaller than a baseball. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like more like a golf ball. I got this out. Mm -hmm. And just put it on the side. So what I like to do is get some seed Sea salt? Not too much now. Let's see how, whoo, that's a lot. Y'all see that amount of, uh, for, let's see, the serving size, if you have a fourth of a teaspoon, that is 550 milligrams of sodium. That's 24% of your daily uh, recommended amount. So, whoo, we have to be careful with that. Good thing we only need a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna. Get a little bit okay. Just got a and little sprinkle bit. it on the tomatoes. Okay. And then what you want to do is put the tomato, tomatoes in the guacamole, well, mm -hmm. in the avocado. Mm -hmm. 
So it's almost like a little bowl. It, it, it's its own little bowl, like. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I forgot was lime. Thank you. So you wanna just cut the lime in half. So, Dr. Giovanni Rondo, how, how does Lyme help your health? Is it healthy for you, bad for you? Uh, well, Lyme is another uh, fruit that for the most part, it's actually pretty healthy for you. You may need to uh, be careful <clears throat> with Lyme if you have a lot of reflux or heartburn because it tends to be a little bit more citrusy and, or acidic. <clears throat> but for the most part, yeah, it adds a nice little touch to you know, a lot of meals, especially like Mexican food, you know, things like that. And I really <laughs> enjoy lime. <clears throat> Occasionally, you know how you have lemon in your drink sometimes? Sometimes it's nice just to have like a piece of lime, you know? And for all you tequila lovers, you know, lime is, you know, anyway. No. Okay, okay, so, so, okay, so after that, after you have everything together, just mm -hmm. add a little bit of garlic, uh, well, onion powder actually. Not a lot. I like this because the aftertaste, it gives it like an actual taste. Mm -hmm. And it, you can actually use any type of seasoning you would like, but I really like onion powder. As opposed to garlic powder? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, you know, that's a question that we could have asked um, Dr. Uh, Williams, and maybe we will eventually, in terms of the health benefits of, because a lot of people talk about garlic and how it can help with high blood pressure. <clears throat> so maybe we can ask him later. And that's how you make <clears throat> avocado bowls. Wow, look at that. And that's so, look at that, it's beautiful. So all you had to do that was very simple. You just cut up the, the avocado and cut up the tomatoes, get that line and add a little bit of sea salt, not a whole lot, we have to be careful, and then a little bit of the onion powder. Wow. Now, I think I'm going to try one of these and see what they taste like and uh, enjoy. <clears throat> so let me try that one right now. Yes, this was an awesome job. Okay. Let me, let me try to get just a little bit of a taste of it because I'm a little hungry at this point. Mmm. Mmm. Mmm-hmm. Absolutely delicious. Absolutely delicious. All right. So... That is the, that wraps up the cooking demonstration portion of our uh, blood pressure boot camp. So thank you all. And I'm gonna try to, okay. So that's that portion. The very last portions are both just like a cool down, which I think we can just, you know, move on from that, just really a cool down and then just a wrap up. And so, uh, we can just do them both really quick. One of the reasons why cooling down is important is um, taking those nice deep breaths in and out, just like we did earlier, actually helps um, with your blood pressure. Taking those nice deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth actually helps to stimulate, or I should, yeah, I should say stimulate the parasympathetic system that helps you to relax and helps to dilate your blood vessels. You need to do that on a regular basis when you're maybe aggravated or you know just trying to relax, take those nice deep breaths. You know how we say, you know, if you're upset, count to 10. Well, if you're upset, deep breathing, you know, 10 times actually will help as well. So doing that, um, if there's any last minute questions, you know, please put it in the chat. I can get that back to you. Um, 
but I want to thank everyone for joining me for this third edition of the Bl Blood Pressure Boot Camp, the foodie uh, version. This has just really been amazing, just talking about high blood pressure, but not just talking about it for education purposes, really trying to understand how food plays a role when it comes to high blood pressure and just our overall health. And I think Dr. Um, Williams did an amazing job with that. Also going over a little bit of exercise routine because that's important. Food and exercise helps um, to control our blood pressure. Relaxation tips like the deep breathing helps as well. And so, um, so I just hope that this has been beneficial to everyone. I hope you may have learned at least something because like my mother uh, would say, and like I said, it was her, would have been her 88th birthday today. I learned something new every day. So I hope that you learned something and then you can use this in terms of not just educating uh, yourself, but transforming your life, using it as a tool to transform your life. Again, I'm Dr. Giovanni Rondo, CEO and founder of Global MD, which is a direct primary care practice. This um, whole session has been sponsored by Global MD. And if you are looking for a primary care physician who does just these things, educates, uh, believing in transforming and empowering our community, um, please come and see me. Um, I am in Jeffersonville and also Louisville, Kentucky. I actually come to you. I make house calls. I'm one of those old fashioned doctors that does house calls, but it's coming. It's a thing now that's coming back around. Um, as we've seen with this pandemic, it's important for people to be as safe as we possibly can. And just going to the to, to homes is, is, is just, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do and get a chance to really get a chance to, to know um, someone and just to have better access. Give me a call, 812-924-7323, or look me up on GobleMD.com. That's www.goblemd.com. Thanks for joining me for this, uh, again, this version of the Blood Pressure Bootcamp. Be well. Bye.